Okay, welcome back to VMworld 2013. This is theCUBE. It's a flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with Dave Vellante, my co-host from wikibon.org, and we're kicking off the day with a awesome interview. CEO of VMware, Pat Gelsinger, CUBE alumni, been on theCUBE, Dave and I, multiple times, so many times, you're like on the leaderboard, so in terms of kind of <laughs> overall <laughs> guest frequency, you've been up there, but also you're also the top dog at, at VMware, and uh, great to see you again. How are you uh, feeling? Thank you, thank you. Good morning, guys. Pleasure. Good to see you. So what's new? I mean, what's, I mean, obviously you're running the show here, and you're running around. Last night you were at the NetApp event, you run to a CIO, R&D. Um, you got to go out and touch all the, the bases. Uh, yeah, out yeah. here, what, 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 what does that look like? What have you done? And well, obviously you did the, the keynote, was awesome. What else is going on? You know, everything, you know, VMworld is just, I mean, it's just overwhelming, right? You know, 23,000 people almost. I mean, you know, the amount of activities around that. And it really has become the infrastructure event for the industry. And you know, if you're anything related, to infrastructure, right, you know, what's going on, right, on the enterprise side of IT, you got to be here, right, and there's parties everywhere, every vendor has their events, every, uh, you know, uh, different particular technology area, a bunch of the things that we're doing, and of course, to me, it's just delightful that I can go touch as many of people, and, you know, they get excited to see the CEO, I have no idea why, but <laughs> hey, I got to show up. You know, you've good. been in the industry for a long time, obviously, you've seen all the movies before, and we've talked about the seas of change when, when we at EMC World when you were there, but we had two guests on yesterday that were notable, Steve Harris, who's now a venture capitalist at General Catalyst, and Jerry Chen, who's a VC at Greylock, and you have a 10-year run here at VMworld, which is the theme to buy convention, but the first five years were a lot different than the last five years, and certainly the last year you were at the helm. So, you know, what's changed in the past 24 months? A lot of stuff has certainly evolved, right? Mm -hmm. So the Nasira acquisition certainly changed the, 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 changed everything, right? You saw software define, data center now come into focus this year, but really it was about less than 24 months, a massive kind of change. Uh, what, what, how do you view all that? How do you talk to your employees and the customers about that change? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as we, as we think about uh, the software-defined data center vision, right, it is a broad, comprehensive, powerful vision for re-architecting how the data center is operated, how customers take advantage of it, you know, and the resultant agility and efficiency that comes from that. And obviously, the NYSERA acquisition was sort of the shot heard around the world as the really, uh, okay, these guys are really serious about making that happen, and it changes every aspect of the data center uh, in that regard. You know, and this year's VM world is really, I'll say, putting the beef on the bones. Right, we talked about the vision, we talked about each of the four legs of it, compute, uh, networking, storage, and management and automation. So this year it's really putting the beef on the bones in the NSX announcement, putting substance behind it. The vSAN announcement, putting substance behind it. The continuing progress in management and automation. And I think everything that we've seen here in the customer conversations, the ecosystem of partner conversations are SDDC is real now get started. And you've, I think, have some fundamental assumptions in that scenario, particularly around x86 in the server space. I mean, essentially, if I understand it, you've said that x86 will dominate that space. So you're, you're expecting status quo in the sense that it will continue to go in the cadence of you know, cores and you know, Moore's Law curve, even though we yeah. know that's changing. But that essentially will stay as is, and it's the other parts, the networking and the storage piece, that you're really where you're defying convention. Is that right? Um, you know, it's, certainly we expect that continuing momentum uh, by the x86, by Intel in that space. But as you go think about software-defined everything, in the data center, it really is taking the power of that same core engine and applying it to these other areas. Because when we say software-defined networking, right, you need a very high packet flow capability, and that's running in software on x86. When you need to talk about data services running in software, right, you need high performance snapshots, file systems, et cetera, running in software, no longer bound to you know, physical array. So it really is taking that same power, that same formula, right, and applying it to the rest of the elements of the data center. And yeah, we're betting big right, that that engine will continue and that will be successful in being able to deliver that value in this software layer running on that core powerful silicon engine. So Pat, so obviously, you know, the, uh, when you came on board, the first thing you did was you said, hey, the pricing, we're going to change some things. Uh, hypervisor has always been kind of this debate, uh, debate, everyone debates about what to do with hypervisor, but still virtualization is still the enabling technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of had this point where the ball's moving down the field and all of a sudden, and in, in, in 2012, it, it changed significantly. And that was a lot, a lot of part of your vision uh, with infrastructure. As infrastructure gets commoditized, what is going to change in the IT infrastructure and, and for service providers 
uh, and the value chains that's going to be disruptive. Obviously, the economics are changing. What specifically is virtualization going to do next with software defined that's going to be the enabling uh, technology? Yeah, and uh, you know, and I have, you know, we're, we're not out to commoditize, we're out to enable innovation. We're out to enable agility, right? And in the course of that, it changes what you expect and what the underlying uh, hardware does. But you know, it's enabling that ecosystem of innovation is what we're about and customers to get value from that. And as you go look at these new areas, hey, you know, we're changing how you do networking, right? All of a sudden, we're going to create a virtual network overlay that has all of these services associated with it that are provisioned just like VMs in seconds. We're creating a new layer of how storage is going to be enabled, you know, this policy-driven capability, taking those capabilities that before were tightly bound to hardware, delivering them through the software layer, enabling this new magnificent level of automation. And yesterday's demo with Carl, I mean, Carl does a great CTO impersonation, <laughs> doesn't he? <laughs> And, uh, He's getting you know, some celebrity action. He's like, yeah, hey, Carl Eschenbach. Oh yeah. Steve boy, Harris you know. gave him the thumbs up too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Steve gave him you know, a good job. But, you know, and so all of those pieces coming together, right, you know, was really, and you know, just the customer and the ecosystem response here at the show has been, oh, Right, you know, SDDC, it's not some crazy thing out there in the future. This is something I can start realizing value for now. Well, it's coming into focus, and it's not 100% clear for a lot of the customers because they're still getting into the cloud, and the hybrid cloud has become, I call it, the halfway house to kind of a fully evolved IT environment. But, you know, how do you No, it is the end game. It, it's hybrid the cloud is not a halfway house. <laughs> well, what are you talking about? <laughs> what I mean, are you talking I mean, about? I mean, two, two full-on <laughs> utility computing. That's yeah. what, that is ultimately what we're saying. Halfway house? Well, I mean, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Help me. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> when what you're in the, a hole, stop digging. So how do, you, how do you define the total addressable market of 50 billion that Carl talked about? Yeah, and you know, as we looked at that, we said across the three things, right, that we said, software-defined data center, right, there's $28 billion hybrid cloud, 14 billion, 8 billion for the uh, uh, end user computing, that's this 50 billion opportunity. But even there, I think that dramatically understates the market opportunity. IT overall is $1.7 trillion. Right, you know, the communications, the services, outsourcing, et cetera. And actually, you know, the piece that we're talking about is really the underpinnings for a much larger set of impact on the part of what applications are going to be developed, how services are delivered, how consumers and businesses are able to take advantage of IT. So yes, that's the $50 billion. We'll give you the math, we'll show you all the details of Gartner's and IDCs to support it. But to us, the vision and the impact that we're out for is far more dramatic than that would even imply. Well, that's, that's good news, because to Carl, it's good that your market cap is bigger than, than <laughs> or your, your TAM is bigger than your market cap. Yeah, right? that's so nice. Said, yeah. Okay, well now yeah, we're about to fix the said, market cap yeah, they, piece. Then yeah. he said, now so. we got to get to 50 billion, so I'm <laughs> glad to hear there's upside to the, yeah. to the TAM. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about the ecosystem conversation. Yeah. When you talk about getting thing in, into things like you know, uh, software-defined networking and software-defined storage, what's the discourse like in the ecosystem? From guys like, let's take the storage side, EMC, you know, that NetApp last night, did they say, hey, you know, software-defined storage, we really like that, but we want to be in that business. Uh -huh. So what, uh -huh. talk about that, that discussion. Yeah, and clearly, every piece of software defined, whether it's software-defined storage, software-defined data services, software-defined security services, or networking, every piece of that has ecosystem implications along the way. But if you would go talk to a NetApp or EMC, they'd say, you know, you're an appliance vendor, and they would quickly respond and say, no, our value's in software, right. and we happen to deliver it as an appliance. And we'd say, great, let's start delivering the software value as a software appliance, right, through virtualization and through the software delivery, you know, mechanisms that we're talking about for this new platform. Now, each one of them then has to adjust their product strategies, their you know, business strategies to enable those software components, right, independent of their hardware elements, uh, for ex full execution and embodiment into this software-defined data center future. But for the most part, right, every one of them is saying yes. Now how do we figure out how to get there and how do we decompose our value, embody it uh, in new ways and how can we enable that in this new software-defined data center vision? And they've always done that with software companies. I mean, certainly Microsoft and Oracle have always grabbed a piece of the storage stack and put it into their own, but it's been very yeah. narrow within yeah. their own spaces. And uh -huh. of course, now VMware is running any application, right, uh -huh. anywhere. 
So it's more of a general purpose platform. So is, absolutely. It a is it a trickier fit for the ecosystem to figure out where that white space is? Oh, absolutely. Every one of them has to figure out their strategy. If you're F5, right? You know, I was with yeah. John McAdam this morning. Yeah. Okay, how do I take my value? And he would very quickly say, hey, you know, our values in software, we deliver it as mostly as appliances, but how do we shift? You know, if you're Checkpoint, okay, you know, they're already, right, you know, a largely software value or Riverbed or, um, you know, the uh, uh, various uh, software vendors and security as well. Each one of them are having to rethink their strategies in the context of software defined. But customers are saying, wow, this is powerful. The agility and the benefits that I get from it, they're driving them to so go there. So what's the key to giving them confidence? Is it transparency, is it sharing roadmaps, joint integration? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, right, anything else, am I missing uh, anything there? Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, also, you know, how we work with them and go to market mm -hmm. uh, as well. You know, how do we work with them as we go to customers? You know, they're expecting from us that, okay, you know, you know, if this is one of our accounts, come in and work with us in those accounts uh, as well. So we do have to be transparent. We have to have the APIs that enable them to do integration. We have to work with them in terms of enabling their innovation in the context of this platform that we're uh, building. But as we work along the way, we're getting good responses to that. Pat, how do you look at the application market? Obviously, end user computing, you guys are beefing that up. You got Sanjay Poonin coming in, and obviously mobile and, and cloud. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before in theCUBE, but core IT has always been enabling kind of the infrastructure, and then you, you get what you get from what you have in IT. Now the shift is applications coming from outside IT, business units and, and, and outside from partners, uh, whether they're resellers. How do you view that tsunami of, of apps coming in that need infrastructure on demand or horizontally scalable at will? Yeah, so first point would be is yes. Right, you know, we do see that, you know, as infrastructure becomes more agile and more self-provision, right, more aligned to the requirements of applications, we do see that it becomes a tsunami of new applications. We're also working very hard to enable IT to be the friend of the line of business, no longer seen as a barrier, but really seen as a friend, partner, enabler of what they're trying to do, because many of the, you know, uh, line of businesses have been finding ways, you know, how do I get around this slow-moving IT? Well, we want to make IT fast moving and enabling to meet their security, governance, you know, SLA requirements while they're also enabling these powerful new applications to emerge. And that to us is what infrastructure is all about for the future, is enabling you know, businesses to move at the speed of business and not have infrastructure being a limiter. And as we're doing things you know, like the big data announcements that we did, enabling infrastructure that's more agility. You'll see us do more things in the app dev area uh, over time and enabling the management tools to integrate more effectively to those environments, self-service portals that are enabling that. And obviously with guys like Sanjay and our mobile initiative, yeah, yeah that's a big step up. Don't you like Sanjay? He's yeah. a great addition to San the team. Sanjay's awesome, he's been great. And, and he's had done a lot on the mobile side, obviously that is something that the yeah, end Yeah, that's an want. interesting way that I put yeah, him yeah, into yeah, that yeah. business group <laughs> for us. So, yeah. Well, on the flash <laughs> side, so under the hood, right? So you look under the hood, um, you got big data on the dashboard, your driver's driving this car to, to the new future of IT. Under the hood, you got flash. That's changing storage a bit, and certainly reconfiguring what a DAS is and NAS and SAN. Obviously you talked about vSAN in your, in your keynote. Um, what is happening to, in your vision with compute? I mean, obviously, if you have more and more apps hitting IT, coming in outside core IT, but have to be managed by core IT, does that change the computing paradigm? Does it make it more distributed, more software? I mean, how do you look at that? Because that changes the configuration of, of, say, the compute architecture. Sure, and you know, a couple of things, if you think about the show here you know, that we've done, you know, two of them in particular in this space, one is vSAN, right? And vSAN is creating converged infrastructure that includes storage. Right, why do you do that? Well now you have you know, storage, you know, I mean that apps are about data, right? <laughs> the apps need data to go operate on, so now we've created right, an integrated storage tier that essentially presents a integrated application uh, environment in commercial infrastructure, that changes the game. We talked about the Hadoop you know, extensions, it changes how you think about these big data applications. Also the Cloud Foundry announcement, right? On, off premise, a PaaS layer to uniquely enable applications, and as they've done that on the PaaS layer, boy, you know, you don't have to think about the infrastructure requirements to deploy that on or off premise, or increasingly, as I forecast for the future, hybrid applications. Born in the hybrid, not born in the cloud, but born in the hybrid cloud applications that truly put the stuff that belongs on premise on premise, puts the stuff that belongs in the cloud in the cloud, right, and enables them to fundamentally work together in a secure operational uh, manner. So the apps are dictating to the infrastructure basically on demand resources and Absolutely. then essentially right. compile and that. The infrastructure says, here's the services that I have already 
ready, right, in catalogs that you can immediately take advantage of. And if this, you fit inside of these catalogs, you're done. It's self-provisions from that point on, and we've automated the operation and everything to go against that. So, so that concept of born in the hybrid is, is a good one. So obviously that's your, your sweet spot. You're going from a position yeah, to Yeah, yeah, and this you know, stupid halfway house yeah. hybrid <laughs> comment. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've never heard something so idiotic opinion, before. Yeah, I don't know, it was probably an Andreessen comment or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's so he's doing well for himself, Mark. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, you go, okay, Google and Amazon obviously going to have a harder time that you know, born in the hybrid. What about Microsoft? They get a good shot at born in the hybrid, don't they? Yeah, you know, and I think you know, I've said the four companies that I think have a real shot to be you know very large, significant players for public cloud infrastructure services. You know, uh, clearly Amazon. You know, Google, they have a large, substantive, very creative company. You know, Microsoft, they have a large position, Azure, right, what they've done with uh, Hyper-V, and ourselves. Uh, and I think that those, you know, the two that sort of, you know, have the natural assets to participate in the hybrid space are us and Microsoft. Uh, at that level, and obviously, you know, we think we have lots of advantages versus Microsoft. We think we're miles ahead of them in SDDC, right? We think the seamlessness and the compatibility that we're building with one software stack, not two, you know, it's not Azure and Hyper-V, it is SDDC in the cloud and on-premise, that that gives us significant advantages, and then we're going to build these value-added services on top of it. You know, like we announced with desktop as a service, Cloud Foundry as a service, DR as a service, we're going to quickly build that stack of capabilities that just gives substantial value to enterprise Customers. So I got to ask you, talk about hybrid since you brought it up again. So um, software-defined data center software. So what happens to the data center, the actual physical data center? You mentioned about the museum. I mean, what is it going to look like? I mean, right now you still have power and cooling. You're going to have out, out utility computing with cloud resources on mm -hmm. demand. People are going to still run data centers. You're talking about the facility. Yeah, the actual facility. I'm oh, still going to have servers. They're going to still on. There'll still be an on-premise. Do you see that? How do you see that phasing out to hybrid? And what does that look like physically for yeah. someone to manage? Just still yeah. power, facility management, all that stuff. Yeah, and in many ways, I, I think here uh, the uh, you know the cloud guys, uh, Google's and uh, Amazon's and Yahoo's and Facebooks have actually led the way in doing some pretty creative work. That these things become you know highly standardized, highly modularized, highly scalable. You know, very few number of admins per server ratio as we go forward. These become very automated factories, right, of cloud execution. Some of those will be on-premise, some of those will be off-premise, but for the most part, they'll look the same, right, in how they operate. And our vision for software-defined data center is, is that software layer is taking away the complexity, right, of what operates uh, underneath it. You know, they'll be standardized, they'll be modularized, you plug in power, you plug in cooling, you plug in network, right, and these things will operate. Basically at effic efficient, efficient down to the bone, yeah. fully automated with software. Yeah, and uh, you know, people will decide what they put in their private cloud, you know, based on business requirements, you know, SLAs, you know, privacy requirements, data governance requirements, right, you know, I mean, in Europe, right, you know, got to be on premise in these uh, locations. And then they'll say, put stuff in the public cloud that allows me to burst effect Effectively. Maybe a DR because I don't do that real well. Or these applications that belongs in the cloud, right? You know, because of its distributed nature. But keep the data on premise. You know, and really treat it as a uh, a menu of options to optimize the business requirements between capex, opex, regulatory requirements, scale uh, requirements, expertise, mission critical, and all of those things that are delivered by a sustainable position, not some stupid hybrid, you know, halfway <laughs> house. A sustainable <laughs> position that optimizes yeah. against the business requirements yeah. that they have. Let me take one of those points, SLA, right? Everybody yeah. likes to attack Amazon on its uh. SLAs, but in many regards, uh, the, uh, the I'm glad I got your attention. <laughs> yeah. That's good, we're going to come back to that, John. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, have, I have six blog posts going in my head right now. I don't think right we're now. done with that talk track. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's easy to attack Amazon on SLAs, and, but in, in essence, the SLA is, a, is a, the, the degree of risk that you're willing to take and put on paper at scale. Mm -hmm. So. How transparent will you will you be with your SLAs with the hybrid cloud, and and you know will they exceed what what Amazon and Google have been willing to promise, and HP for that matter, have been willing to promise at scale? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're going to be transparent. The SLAs will have real teeth associated uh, with them. You know, real business consequences for lack of execution uh, against them. You know, they will be highly transparent. You know, we're going to have you know true. I mean, we're going to measure these things and you know provide uh, uptime commitments, et cetera, against them. You know, that's what an enterprise service is expected. Right, you know, at the end of the day, that's what enterprises demand, right? You know, and when so when you pick up the phone and need support, you get it. Right, and our, you know, the VMware support is legendary. I mean, we, you know, I'm just delighted by the support services that we offer, uh, and the customer response to those is, you know, hey, you fixed my problem, even when it wasn't your problem. 
right, and make it work. And that's what enterprise customers want because that's what they have to turn around and commit back to their uh, businesses against all of the other things as well, you know, real regulatory requirements, audit requirements, all of those types of things. That's what being an enterprise provider is all about. All right, John wants to get back and talk about hybrid cloud. <laughs> no, I want to talk about OpenStack, because you guys are big, big behind OpenStack, and you talked about it as a market expansion. Mm -hmm. um, where you, internally, what are the, some of the development conversations and sales conversations with customers around OpenStack in terms of status, what is it doing, how you guys are looking at that and, and, and getting involved? Yeah, and you know, we've clearly said you know, you know, that you have to think about OpenStack right, you know, in the proper way. OpenStack is a framework for building clouds and you know, for people who are wanting to build their own cloud as opposed to get the prepackaged cloud, right? You know, this is our strategy to enable those APIs, to give our components to those customers to help them go build it, right? And those customers largely are service providers, internet providers who have unique scale, integration, and other requirements, and we're finding it as a good market expansion opportunity for us. Put our components in those areas, contribute to the open source projects where we truly have IP and can differentiate uh, for it, like at the hypervisor layer, like at the uh, right networking uh, layer, and it's actually going pretty well. You know, in our Q2 earnings call, you might recall, you know, I talked about that our business with the public OpenStack customers was growing faster yeah. than the rest of our business. That's pretty significant, right? If you say, wow, you know, if it's growing faster, that says, well, the strategy's working, right? And we are seeing a good, good response there, and you know, clearly we want to communicate. We're going to continue that strategy going forward. And the install base of virtualization is obviously impressive, and the question I want to ask you is, how do you see the evolution of the IT worker? I mean, you have in the old model DBA, system admins, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, now you have data science on the big data side. So with software defined data center, the virtualization team seems to be the center uh, point for that. What roles do you see changing with hybrid cloud and software-defined data center and then mm -hmm. user computing? Well, I think sort of the theme of our conference was defy convention, right? And why did we do that? Because we really see that the, you know, the virtual admin, the virtual infrastructure, that they really have become the center of IT. Now, we need the competence of networking, the security guys, of the database guys, but that now has to happen in the context, right, of a virtualized environment. You know, the DBA doesn't get to control his unique infrastructure. The Hadoop guy doesn't get his own unique infrastructure. They're all just workloads that run on this virtualized infrastructure that is increasingly adept and adaptable, right, to these uh, different workload uh, areas. And that's what we see going yeah. forward as we reach into these new areas. And the virtual admin, he has to go make best buddies with the uh, networking guy and say, let me talk to you about virtual networking and how we're going to cross between mm -hmm. the virtual overlay domain and the physical domain and how these things are going to stitch together for making your job better Right, and delivering a better solution for our line of business and for our customers. Well, one thing you did to defy convention was to get on stage with, with Mark Andreessen. <laughs> so, we want to talk about that a little bit. You guys had what I would call a you know, slight disagreement. And, no, uh, just, the just in the future. Yeah, just a little. So, but I thought you were kind to him. He said, you know, no startup that I work with you know, doesn't <laughs> any servers. And, and I thought you were going to, no, never mind, I won't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even go there, too many friends. Um, no, so, so talk about that a little bit, that discussion that you had, your sure. view of the world and, and, uh -huh. and Mark's, how, did, how do you respond to, to, to that statement? Do, do they grow up into VMware customers? Is that sort of oh, the, yeah, the obvious answer? You know, I mean, I, I have a lot of uh, regard, you know, Mark and I have known each other for probably close to two decades now, and you know, we've partnered and sparred together for a long time, and you know, he's a smart, successful guy, and I appreciate his opinions. You know, but he takes a very narrow view, right, of a venture seed, fund, right, who is optimizing cash flow, right, and why would they spend capital on cash flow when they can go get it as a service? That's exactly the right thing for a very early stage startup company to do in most cases, right? And Mark driving his companies to do that makes a lot of sense. But at the end of the day, right, if you want to reach into enterprise customers, you got to deliver enterprise services, right? You got to be able to, you know, scale these things. You got to be cost effective at these things. And then all the other aspects of governance, SLAs, et cetera, that we already talked about. You know, so, you know, in that view, I think Mark's view is very perspective. Well, also Zynga and those guys, when they grew up on Amazon, they went yeah. right to bare metal yeah. as soon as they started to scale. Yeah, they had to bring it back in, right? Because they needed the SLAs, they needed the cost structures, they wanted to have the control of some of those applications. And rental is more expensive than, yeah. than owning <laughs> right, you know, at the I mean, end of the day. Yeah. You're, 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 somebody's <laughs> got to pay the margins, right? You know, on top of that to the providers. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate the perspective, but to me it is very narrow and parochial to that point of view, and I think the industry is much broader, right, and things like policy and regulations are going to take decades, right, not years, you know, multiple decades for these things to uh, change and roll oh, yeah. out to enable, I'll say, a mostly public cloud world, ever, 
right? And that's why I say I think the hybrid is not a way station, right? It is the right balance point that gives customers flexibility to meet their business demands across a range of things. And Mark and I, obviously, were quite uh, in disagreement over that particular and, point. And John, once again, Nick Carr, you know, missed the mark, but he made a lot of money. Oh, yeah. well, I think Mark, Mark Andreessen wants to put everyone in that book. Everyone could be the next Facebook where you, know, you build your own. I think that's not a reality in the enterprise. They kind of want to mm -hmm. be like Facebook, like with applications, but, mm -hmm. but I want to ask about uh, automation. So we talked to a lot of customers here in theCUBE and they yep. all, we all asked them the question, automation, orchestration at the top of the stack, they all want it, but they all say they all have different processes and you really can't have a general purpose software approach. Um, so Dave and I were commenting uh, last night uh, when we got back uh, after the NetApp event was, you know, you and Paul Moritz were talking in 2010 around this hardened top when, the, when you introduced that stack, and with you know, infrastructure as a service, is there, is there a hardened top where functionality is more important than, than um, which hardware you buy, and it's more important than which hardware you buy, so you can enable some of those service catalogs, some of those agility features mm -hmm. in automation, because every customer will have a different process to be automated, Yeah. and yeah. how do you do that without human intervention? Mm -hmm. So where is that hardened top now? I mean, you, is it platform as a service, or is it still at the infrastructure as a service model? Yeah, I think clearly the line between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service will blur, right? And you know, it's really not clear you know, where you can quite draw that line. Also, as we make infrastructure more application aware, right, and have more application developer services associated with it, you know, that line will blur even more. So I think it's going to be hard to call, you know, here's that simple line associated um, with it. You know, we'd also argue that, you know, in this world that, you know, customers, you know, they have, you know, heterogeneous tools that they need to work with. You know, some will have bought in, you know, in big ways to some of the legacy tools, and as much as we're going to, you know, try to help them move past some of those uh, brittle environments, you know, that takes a long time as well. I'd also say that uh, you know, it's the age of APIs, not UIs. Right, and for us it's very much to, to expose our value through programmatic interfaces so customers truly can right, have the flexibility to integrate those and give them more choice, even as we're trying to build a, a more deeply integrated and automated stack that meets a general right, uh, set of needs uh, for our customers. So that makes a question, at the top of the stack where end user computing is going to sit and you're going to advance that, that piece, what, what's the to-do item for you? What needs to happen there? Is it, it on a scale of one to 10, 10 being fully baked out, where is it, where are the white spaces that need to be tweaked either by partners or by VMware. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you know we're pretty quickly, I'll say, finishing the stack with regard to the you know traditional PC environments, and I think the amount of work to do for the mobile environment, right, is still quite enormous uh, as we uh, go forward. And uh, in that, you know, we're excited about Horizon getting some good uptake, a number of uh, partner announcements uh, this uh, week. But there's a lot to be done uh, in that space because you know people want to be able to secure apps, provision apps, deprovision apps, have secure workspaces, social uh, experiences, a rich range of of integration to the authentication uh, devices associated with it, be able to have you know, applications that are developed in that environment that access this hybrid uh, infrastructure effectively uh, over time, be able to self-compose those applications, put them into enterprise right, stores and operations, be able to access this big data infrastructure. There's a whole lot of work to be done in that space and I think that'll keep us busy for quite a number of years. This is great, we're here, Pat Gelsinger inside theCUBE. Um, we could keep rolling <laughs> until we get to get the hook. But uh, a couple more final questions is, the analogy of cloud has always been like the grid, electricity. Um, you kind of hinted to this earlier. I mean, is that a fair comparison? Electricity is kind of clean, it's, it's stable, we have an actual national grid, mm -hmm. uh -huh. doesn't have bad data and hackers coming through it. So, is that still a fair view of cloud um, to kind of just look, talk about plugging electricity in the wall for yeah, IT. I, I think that is so trite, right? And it came up in the, uh, you know, the panel we had with Andreessen, Bechtelsheim, Graham, and myself, because you know, you know, it was so standardized, 120 volts AC, Right, yeah. you know, hey, maybe it gets distributed as four, four, forty, three, three phase, but you know, it is so standardized, it hasn't moved, right? You know, socket standards, right? You're done. You know, think how fast this cloud world is evolving, yeah. right? The line between IaaS and PaaS that we just touched upon, the services that are being uh, offered on top of it, security, yeah, yeah, all of these different things. You know, to me, that is such a trite, simple analogy that it beca has become so used and abused yeah. in the process that I think it pe leads people to such wrong conclusions, right, about what we're doing and the innovation that's going on here and the potential that we're going to offer. So I hope that every one of our competitors takes that and says that's the right model yeah. because I think it leads them to exactly <laughs> the wrong conclusion. I couldn't agree more. The big switch is the big myth. <clears throat> I wanted to get tactical for a minute. Um, I listened to your you know, conference calls. I can't wait to read the transcript. I just go, I got to listen to the calls. Uh, but just observing those and, and, and the conversations around here, 
I, I was going to ask you, I always ask CEOs, you know, what keeps you up at night, and they always say execution. So let's focus on execution for the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. I, I, I came up with the following. So you maintain dominance in vSphere, uh, get revenue beyond vSphere, broaden end user license agreements, um, increase end user computing adoption, and proof points around hybrid cloud. Are those the big ones? Did I miss anything? That's a good list. Yeah? Yeah, that's a good list. Okay, so uh, that's the thing, those, those are things that observers should watch over the next, say, 12 to 18 months as indicators mm -hmm. of success and uh, of, of what you're doing and what you're driving. Yeah, you know, and clearly inside of that with SDDC, obviously we think this environment for uh, networking, right, and what we, you know, we've really, uh, uh, I'll say, delivered that, you know, that, that, that would be one in particular inside of that category that we would uh, call out. You know, with regard to our hybrid cloud uh, strategy, it's clearly globalizing that platform, right? We announced Savvis here, right? But we need to make this available on a global basis. You go to an enterprise customer and they're going to say, you know, I need, uh, you know, services in uh, all right, Japan. I need services in Singapore. I need to be able to operate, right, on the global basis. So clearly, you know, having that platform, building out the services on top okay. of it, you know, is another key aspect of building those, uh, you know, hybrid uh, use cases and more of the value on top of it. And then in the EUC space, we touched a bit on the mobile thing already. So we'll have <clears throat> Martin on later, but his, his PowerPoint demonstration. What a rock star, what a rock star. He is a rock star, we've had him on before, he's fantastic. But his PowerPoint demonstration was very simple, you know, made it seem so simple, it's not uh -huh. going to be that easy to virtualize the, the network. Can you talk about the headwinds there and the challenges that you have and the things that you have to do to actually make progress there and really move the needle? Yeah, and you know, it really sort of boils down in two aspects. One is, you know, we, we are suggesting that you know, there will be a software layer for networking that is far more scalable, agile, and robust than you could do in a physical networking layer. That's a pretty tall order, yeah. right? You know, I need to be able to scale to tens, hundreds, millions of VMs, right? I need to be able to scale to terabits of cross-sectional packet flow. Uh, through this, I need to be able to deliver services on top of this, right? That truly allow firewalls, load balancers, right? IDSs, all of those things to be ambitious. agile, scale. Uh -huh. you know, yeah, it is ambitious. This is right the most radical architectural statements in networking in the last 20 or 30 years, and that's what gets uh, Martine uh, passionate. So there's a lot of technical scale, and we really feel good about what we've done, right? But being able to prove that with robust scalability. Right, you know, for which, like the hypervisor, it is more reliable than hardware today. And be able to be able to make that same statement about NSX, that just like ESX, it is better than hardware, right, in terms of its reliability, its resilience. You know, that's an important thing for us to accomplish technically in that space. And then the other piece is showing customer value. Right, getting those early customers. And you know, what a powerful picture. You know, GE, Citigroup, and yes. eBay. Right, you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> right, you know, these are massive customers. Right, and being able to prove the value and the use cases in the customer settings. Right, you know, and if we do those two things, you know, we think that, you know, truly we will have accomplished something very, very special yeah, uh, right. in the networking domain. Absolutely. Pat, talk about the innovation strategy. You've been now a year under your belt at VMware, um, and you also with EMC and Intel, and you, we, we mentioned on theCUBE many times, cadence of Moore's Law was kind of the culture of Intel. Why don't you talk about the innovation strategy of VMware going forward, your vision, but also talk about the culture, and, and talk about the one thing that, that, that VMware has from a culture that makes it unique, and what is that unique feature of the VMware culture? Yeah, and you know, we, we, we spent time as a, as a team talking about you know, what is it that drives our innovation, that drives you know, our passion. And clearly, you know, you know, as we've talked about our values as a team, you know, it is very much about this passion for technology and passion for customers. And how those two coming together, right, with fundamental, disruptive, wow kind of technologies, where people just say, like they did with the, when they first used ESX, and they say, wow, I just, didn't ever envision that you could possibly do that. And that's the experience that we want to deliver over and over again, right? So, you know, you know hugely disruptive, powerful, software-driven virtualization technologies for these domains, but doing it in a way that customers just fall in love with our technologies. And, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, I got a, uh, a note from Sanjay, and I just asked him, you know, what do you think of VMworld? And he said, right, you know, it is like a cult geek fest, <laughs> right? Because, right, you know, there's just this deep passion around what people do with our technology. 
right? You know, and they're, they're not even at that point, you know, they're not customers, they're not partners. They are deeply aligned, yeah. right? You know, passionate zealots around what we are doing to make their lives so much more powerful, so much more enabled, yeah. right? And ultimately, yeah. a lot more fun. I mean, people, it's like, it's like being like a car buff. You know, you got to know the engine, you want to know the speeds and feeds. It is a tech culture. Yeah, it is absolutely Pat, thanks great. thanks for coming on theCUBE. We <coughs> spent a lot of time with you here. I know we got, went a little bit over. I appreciate your time. Always great to see you. Oh, it's great Looking to see good. you as well. Thank tech you. athlete, Pat Gelsinger, you. touching all the bases here. We saw him last night at AT&T Park. Uh, great event here, VMworld 2013. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break, Pat Gelsinger, CEO on theCUBE. Thank you.